I met Ruha on March 8, 2016, while volunteering with receiving boat refugees on the shores of Lesbos. A colleague and I had just started night shift when we heard of a boat to which contact had broken off shortly after their call for help. We searched for hours in the dark, driving down numerous dirt roads to small beaches, hoping people had made it safely ashore. Suddenly, in front of a fisher house, a group of people was recognizable, and a young woman rushed out of the garden gate, grasped my hand through the open car window, and asked for help in perfect English. Talking about that night makes it all come back. The gnarled olive trees illuminated by our headlights. The desperate way I kept zooming Google Maps with two fingers, trying to find one possible landing space after another. The small beaches where I got out of the car in vain and called, is there anybody? Into the empty darkness. Every detail of that night is so tangible in my memory that I can almost feel Ruha's cold hand in mine. I had a very happy childhood, but now everything has changed, said Ruha. The war in Syria had turned the 20-year-old English student at the University of Damascus into a 23-year-old head of a family with the task of bringing herself, her 93-year-old grandmother, two sisters and a female cousin safely to Sweden via the dangerous Balkan route. For Grandma Amina, no adequate accommodation where she would have been hosted with all four granddaughters could be found outside the camp. The thought of her continuing to sleep on the gravel floor of a tent in a camp stuck with me and weighed heavily on Ruha. I rented a bigger apartment and invited them to live with me. Grandma Amina had a proper bed and Ruha some relief from this immense responsibility she had been given. For me, these four months of living together have been a great enrichment. We've grown together, learned some words, habits, and stories of each other. And I definitely had some fantastic food. <laughs> Seeing the specific struggles of those five women right in front of my eyes made me wonder, though, how life in an overcrowded refugee camp with poor sanitary facilities must be for single women and mothers. And I started going to Camp Moria together with Ruha to talk to the women with Ruha's translation. When we asked them what they needed, the answers were always the same. Better hygiene, relaxation, information, advice, and safety. Safety, that was the word we heard most. Women did not feel safe anywhere in the camp. The fear of being attacked while sleeping, of going to the toilet at night, of standing in line and being pushed while waiting for food or asylum services. Fear is a constant companion in the camp. This year, the number of refugees has exceeded 100 million for the first time. According to the United Nations, half of them are women and girls. Women free from war, torture, persecution, and trafficking. When they do, the biggest problem is sexual gender-based violence. Three out of five women on the run are affected by it, and they encounter it in all stages of their flight. Sexualized violence is already a reality for many women in peacetime, but it increases with armed conflicts and even more during flight. Once they arrive in refugee camps in Europe, 
poor security measures lead to further assault and sometimes also to forced prostitution. It was obvious there was a gap. Other organizations were offering emergency aid, such as medical assistance or non-food items, but what women needed most was a safe space, tailored to their needs. Outside the camp, where addressing assaults would be anonymous and not lead to further stigmatization. I had found it so in February 2016, when after some months of volunteering, I was positive that I would continue to support refugees one way or another in my future life. Recognizing this gap, I decided together with the four women that were running so in the meantime, to focus fully on displaced women. We were inspired to create that place, that oasis the women could come to and spend some time away from the stress and the harsh conditions of the camps. We found a house in the old part of town with a little courtyard, renovated it, and welcomed the first women. We named it Bashira, which means good news. And it was a community center at the beginning. We soon realized, though, that women fleeing alone were specifically traumatized and needed specific support. So we started to specialize. Only a year later, we opened our second center in Athens because it became obvious that the women who were allowed to leave the island and go to the mainland needed further support from us. We called this center after Grandma, Amina. At our two-day centers, we offer a range of services that help women to rebuild their life, such as professional psychosocial services and assistance with accommodation and bureaucracy. We also offer English language courses and a variety of workshops that help with integration. In our two centers, the women laugh, sleep, cry, dance, learn, drink tea, and find the courage and strength to move on in life. Our teams provide them with a sense of normality and togetherness. They're all professionals that have several years of experience in the migration context. Social scientists, psychologists, and social workers. Dedicated translators from the refugee community are trained by us and help with communication. But who are the women that we support and how do we make a difference in their life? Let me give you some examples. Mariam, a teenager, desperately waiting for her 14th birthday when she walked into the Amina Center proudly. Now I can be an Amina woman like my mother. She was a kid. But within a year, she was a woman because she was raped in the park. Before she turned 17, her Greek was close to fluent. She moved on to a different part of Greece with her mother and brother. She had the support through referrals and collaborations, psychological, social empowerment. My colleague Teresa says, she will always be in my dreams and I will always worry for her. I know she was helped, but I hope she finds peace. Hannah, a seemingly strong woman with a history of chronic disease and a tendency to break every rule in the medical book. She dreamed every day of Germany the promised land of many. In her case, a son was waiting. She waited patiently for years to sort her paper, but she had no clue how. 
She came from a remote village in Afghanistan, had never gone to school. She kept her story to herself. Her papers were sorted because we organized a lawyer who gave it his all to reunite her with her son. When it was time to leave, she left a shawl she had knitted, so we don't forget. She hugged everyone, walked through the gate, waved goodbye, and went on to a different stage in her life. She made it just before reunification became an utopia for many, just before she lost accommodation. Camille, Charlotte, and Marie were three women from West Africa. Their bond was HIV. They supported each other, talking about the fear of having to start treatment, but making a thumb up sign when referring to the medical unit they had to visit. No complaints, they take good care of us. They learned to trust that there is life after HIV, that there is a future to make plans because they had each other and our safety network to support them. They moved on with their children, but only after they learned how to seek medical assistance, how to find a job, and how important it is to know your rights. Nobody could do to them what had been done before. One of them called one day and said, I didn't call to ask for help. I wanted to tell you that when my doctor asked if I had family here, I said, yes, Amina. Fatme, 20 year old from Iran. I left my country because police were everywhere. Police is outside your door, in your car in your coffee cup. I deserve to have a free life. I don't want to lie to get asylum. I do not have a sad story. I, have, I had a happy childhood, a family who loves me. They set me free, for in my country, I was condemned. I'm intelligent, educated, and independent. Mark my words, I will make it. While trying, she needed the pathways for accommodation, food, and legal services, and a place where she was free to express herself. Well, now and then she also needed a hug and someone to remind her how strong she is. She made it with dignity. You see, the story of displaced women are not good stories, but they're stories of survivors, not of victims. For every person that makes it, there are dozens who do not, not because they did not want to, but because life did not gift them with dedicated professionals and volunteers to provide them with security safety and protection. I had a happy childhood. Ruha and her relatives were able to join their family in Sweden unharmed without having to cross the perilous Balkan route. Ruha is back to university but had to start from the scratch. She is still struggling with the weather the culture, and the fact that even after six years, she still doesn't have a permanent residency. But when traveling through France with me last summer and standing in the middle of a blooming lavender field, she said, I still hate this never ending war. I still mourn the loss of what I once called home. But if it wasn't for that war, I would never have met you and never seen these lavender fields in my life. I encourage you to meet 
displaced people with openness, to see them not as refugees, but simply as people you're getting to know, because their identity is not refugee. They had a life before they had to flee, and now they are building a new one together with us. I had a happy childhood. Thank you.